February 28th, 2015. We're here at the show of shows with uh, Captain George Klein, a Jewish war veteran. I was. <laughs> you Still <always> am. <laughs> you was and you, you always will be. Right. Mr. Klein, thank you very much for giving us your time. I'd like to go back in time with you. Okay. To where you grew up. I grew up in Chicago. I was born in Detroit, lived there for two years, moved to Chicago with my mother, lived there for basically all my life. In high school, what in, high school did you I attend? went to Lakeview High School in Chicago. Did you complete your high school education? Yes, I completed my high school education. And after high school, uh, what year was that? That was in 1938 that I graduated. Uh, I had joined the Illinois National Guard uh, which was a horse-drawn artillery outfit in 1938 when I was 17 years old. I went then f to uh, Wright Junior College in Chicago and I was there for a year. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign for a year and then I went in the Army on active duty. And what year were you activated? Uh, we were activated in February of 1941, the Illinois National Guard. I was with the 122nd Field Artillery Battalion. That was just shortly, uh, that was almost 11 months before. We went in for a year's training, as a lot of the National Guard did in 1941. And uh, we were supposed to be there from February of 41 until February of 42. And obviously something happened in December of 1941 that changed the whole thing. Tell me where you were on December 7th, 1941. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, having breakfast with friends. And the news came across? On the radio. We got on a train, all the veterans, or all the soldiers who were there, most of us were from Camp Forest, Tennessee, which was in Tullahoma. And uh, we went down to the station, went back to, uh, back to camp. Got there about 11 o'clock that night. Did you have any idea before you got on that train, what was going to happen in the next couple no, of days? No, had no idea. Were you ordered to report back? No, but we thought we should go. What did you and the rest of the fellows think when they heard the name Pearl Harbor? Did anybody know where Pearl Harbor was? Well, I'm sure some people did, I didn't. But they said it was in the Hawaiian Islands and I knew where they were. So it's 1941, Right. you went back to camp. Right. What happened after that? Uh, we just continued our training. And in uh, 1942, in May of 1942, I was selected to go to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma for OCS, Officer Candidate School. I was there for three months and I became what they called a 90-day wonder. And it was a wonder that we graduated in 90 days. <laughs> so the graduation took place and where was your next stop? My next stop was in Cap Forest, Tennessee again with the 80th Infantry Division, which was a new division being sent. We were the cadre of officers uh, who went there. And uh, how long did you spend there approximately? Uh, I was there uh, uh, until, uh, I have to uh, back it up a little bit, and not back it up, but let me give you the interim story. Uh, in uh, December of uh, 1942, there was a call for the uh, uh, anybody who wanted to go to the 2nd Army Ranger School, which was being held in Camp Forest, Tennessee, and I volunteered for that. Uh, it was a three-week school. I graduated from that school along with about 400 other people. Started out with 600 in the school. and. Uh, at the end, we were sent back to our old outfits. In March, they issued a call for volunteers to form the 2nd Ranger Battalion. I volunteered and was accepted in that uh, as of the 1st of April in 1943. That was the inception of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. You know, I, I'm hearing a lot of volunteering. Everybody runs away when they hear the word volunteer. Well, no, that's yes and no. Uh, Volunteerism, as far as I'm concerned, is an honorable profession. I don't care whether it's military, civilian, or whatever it is, because if you don't have people who volunteer to do something, nothing's going to be done. From the time you got to boot camp mm -hmm. to the second uh, Ranger Division, mm -hmm. uh, were you still with any friends 
from boot camp that followed uh, along with you on the same run? No, no. And that didn't bother you at all. You no. didn't care. You you wanted to do what you wanted to That's do. That's right. Exactly. So he, did you know what you were getting into? Had no idea. Was there extra pay involved? No, no. Uh, I was a second lieutenant. I made, as I recall, one hundred and forty-two dollars a month, uh, and uh, that was wonderful. That's <laughs> more money than I ever seen in my life. Did Did anybody tell you that if you went to the airborne, you'd get another fifty dollars a month? No. No. You think you would have gone into the airport no. if you heard that? No, no. So here we are. We're moving right along. Yeah, we're selling Camp Forest, Tennessee, moving right along. And where, where was the next hop in your uh, uh, career? The next hop in my area was out of the Rangers because I fell off a cliff and broke my ankle. While I was in the hospital mending, the uh, battalion moved, moved on. I went back to the 80th Division. Uh, the uh, commanding officer and I didn't really agree on much, and he was a major and I was a second lieutenant, so it was done his way, okay? And I'll give you just a, a quick story that uh, uh, illustrates that. One day, uh, I saluted him with a highball. I don't know if you know what a highball is, but that's a highball instead of that. And he stood me up in front of the battalion and gave me a lesson. He was a West Pointer gave me a lesson on how to salute. From that day on, I don't think he and I agreed on anything. Anyhow, what I did was I applied for a transfer for overseas duty, and uh, it was accepted. I was sent overseas. I went to Ireland with the 5th Infantry Division. Um, in uh, February of 1944, uh, I, was walking down this, I was walking down Regent Street, in London, I was on leave, and I bumped into the commanding officer of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, who was at that time, he had been a major when I knew him, he's now Colonel, Colonel Rudder. And I stopped and saluted him, and I said to, uh, this is in all my stories, by the way, because I remember it perfectly. Uh, I said, you probably don't remember me, Colonel, but I'm, he said, you're the idiot lieutenant who fell off the cliff. Okay? Uh, he was that kind of a guy, because this is a year later, he still remembered me. And what he said was, how would you like to rejoin the 2nd Ranger Battalion? We're here in England. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, all you have to do is go down to Paddington Station, get on the train, go down to Bude in England, which is down near Land's End, tell them I sent you, and uh, you'll be all set. Well, here I am in dress uniform, pinks and greens, and I said, Colonel, I have to go back to Ireland and get my stuff. He said, no, you don't. He said, I'll take care of that. So I got on the train, went down to uh, Bude, Bude, England. Uh, I walk in. I'm the only person in, in view who's dressed up. Everybody else is in fatigues and dirty clothes and so forth. They thought, probably thought I was a spy. Anyhow, I went over to the supply sergeant. He supplied me with some fatigues. And that's how I got back into the, into the into the Rangers. This was in February of 1944. February 1944. Right. The next couple of months you spent training in England. That's right. We were we were either in England uh, or uh, on the uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Isle Isle Isle. After this is over, I'll tell you the name of the island, uh, but. Uh, that's where most of our training was. The Isle of Wight. Uh, that's where most of our training was. And uh, up and down the coast where they had cliffs. And now we're learning how to uh, climb cliffs. Uh, which went on and physical training. And infiltration. And we'd go out on the countryside and get back the best way we could. <clears throat> and that went on until the uh, middle of May of 1944 when we were uh, moved out of camp, and incidentally, when we were in uh, Bude, we were uh, billeted in private homes. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the people did, uh, did very well. I can't remember the name of the family I was with. It was somebody like Carrington or Carruthers. I really just don't remember. But they were delightful people. Two of us, uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, Jacob Hill and I, shared a bedroom in that uh, in their home 
Anyhow, in the middle of May, we are transferred to uh, uh, Weymouth, uh, which is a big harbor, and we are secluded. And now we've been training. We knew what we were going to do. We knew we were, go we were going to be ass assaulting a, uh, a high point someplace. We had no idea where it was or anything of that nature. We knew what it looked like. We knew what we were going after, and but now we're giving our we are given our specific target, which uh, still didn't have a name, but it was a gun position, uh, which was going to be in between a couple of landing areas. Uh, roughly, let me say the first of June, we are now told we are going to be assaulting. A, place <clears throat> across the channel uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, an area between two beaches, there are going to be two landing areas. We're going to be assaulting a high point which is supplied with uh, six gun positions. They showed us pictures of the gun positions, where the guns are, and uh, we could see them very carefully. We could see the guns poking out of the uh, gun positions are all camouflaged on top uh, and uh, the place is called Pont du Hoc and Pont du Hoc as we found out later is midway between Omaha and Utah Beach and it's a it's mounted on a cliff that's approximately a hundred feet high a hundred feet being the uh, the height of about a 10-story ten building uh, we are given uh, specific targets Fox Company is landing on the uh, north end of the point on the eastern side and our, our targets, our gun positions one and two, an anti-aircraft uh, position and two uh, machine gun emplacements along with uh, connecting, there are connecting tunnels that run from uh, sleeping quarter to sleeping quarter to sleeping quarter for all the, uh, uh, the German uh, soldiers there and mi that's mission number one. Mission number two is to establish a roadblock on what they call the uh, Grand Camp Verville Road, which is the road that runs parallel to uh, the, the shore and is the route that would be used by German reinforcements either Omaha or Utah Beach. Uh, we're supposed to take off on the 5th of June. Uh, we are sent to the ships. Uh, we're on a uh, British transport called the Ben McCree uh, and uh, the battalion, the second ranger battalion is being split into three different groups. Uh, a company and B company and the fifth ranger battalion are to follow us up the, uh, up, up the cliff after we've been up there, assaulted it, and taken uh, a position at the point. Uh, Charlie Company is to land somewhere between uh, uh, Pont du Hoc and what is called Omaha Beach, uh, at a place called uh, Point de la Percy, P-E, forget how it's spelled. Uh, and uh, then they're to come across land and join up with us. Um, obviously, uh, as you may know, uh, the, uh, the assault is postponed for, for one day. The weather on the 5th of June was terrible, the seas were too high and so forth. Uh, so we take off on, oh, I would say around uh, midnight or one o'clock in the morning on the 6th of June. We disembarked. Well, we didn't. We embarked on our LCAs. They are loaded into the uh, into the water, and we take off at about four four thirty in the morning. We're scheduled to land at six o'clock. The first foul up happens when uh, Colonel Rudder discovers that the whole flotilla is going to the wrong point. It's going toward Point de la Percy. So he. Uh, immediately told the, the British coxswain, or whatever he's called, who's steering the boat, you're going to the wrong place, we have to go up there, which is a good 400, 500 yards uh, to, the, uh, to the west. Now this means that now we're, we're traveling parallel to the 
shoreline and we start taking some small arms fire. Uh, one of the boats uh, from D Company, uh, Captain Slater's boat, founders and sinks. The, uh, uh, we were all wearing, by the way, besides all of our other equipment, we were wearing a May West. Uh, and if you can imagine what we looked at, we're about this big and we got stuff all over us. Anyhow, uh, nobody stopped for them uh, because to stop for anything for anybody at any time is contrary to uh, anything that has to do with the mission. The mission comes first. <clears throat> we found out later that he, they were, he and everybody in that boat were picked up, sent back to the battleship Texas. And the Texas at this time is out in the channel someplace providing uh, bombardment of the point itself. Uh, make a long story short, that puts us about 30, 35 minutes behind time, and which means that the bombardment, both air and from, sh from the sea, ended at about 6 o'clock. So they've got about 30, 35, 40 minutes uh, to get out of their holes up on top of the point and uh, do whatever they could. Most, and we found out, <clears throat> all of the defenses, the German defenses at Point du Hoc were inland rather than towards the shore because nobody, be, nobody was going to be able to climb this cliff. It was impossible, they thought. Uh, our force consisted of three companies plus part of headquarters company, a total of 220, 225, 225 men. Uh, we landed, we hit, well, and each boat has four or two or six uh, small rocket launchers, and what, it's, what they are firing, they're firing a grapnel, which is on a steel post with five arms sticking out, and they're fired by a, an explosive charge. <clears throat> As we started to fire them, we find out that because the weather, <coughs> bless you, <Excuse> me. <laughs> the weather has not been good, uh, the ropes are wet, and obviously when you take a wet a rope, it adds maybe 50 or 100 percent to the weight of the rope. So all of our grapnels are falling short. So we stopped firing them until we hit the shore. When we hit the shore, we either fired them from the LCA or we took the launchers off the LCA, put them on the ground, and then fired them, and now they start going up. Obviously, we are taking small arms fire at this time. We're shooting back. Uh, now, if you shoot up at a 10-story building, you got to wait till somebody sticks his head out. Uh, and they can't shoot down at us unless they can look over and see us. Um, they're throwing grenades. And fortunately, most of the grenades, or all of the grenades that, we, that I saw, were concussion grenades as opposed to our grenade, which is a fragmentation grenade. So it makes a loud noise and scares the hell out of you, but that's, that's about it. Um, the first men go up the ropes are stronger than I was, lighter than I was, and so forth. They maybe weighed 140, 140 pounds. They went up the cliffs hand over hand on these ropes. <clears throat> During the bombardment, uh, the face of the cliff itself has been bombarded by large shells from the Texas and from a destroyer, the Satterley, which I'll tell you about later. And the effect of that is to knock parts of the cliff down so that the bottom of it is covered with scree. It's chunks of clay, clay, dirt, and so forth and so on. You have what I would call almost a ramp that goes up about 30 feet. So instead of having to go up 100 feet, we only have to go up seven. These guys went up hand over hand. And enough of them went up and got to the top so that they were able to take whatever German troops were up there under fire and drive them back. Then they pulled up either rope ladders or um, what they called um, toggle rope, toggle ropes. And a toggle rope is merely an eight foot section of rope with a noose at one end and a wooden toggle at the end. You hook them together and you've got something to climb up. Or as we started to going up, the way I got up 
was on a steel ladder. And the steel ladder is an eight foot section of pipe with footholds welded to it. And you go up eight feet, you take another one, you put it up another one, you've got another eight feet, and you build the ladder as you are going up, um, which is what we did. Within, uh, I would say within 45 minutes to an hour at the most, the whole battalion is up on the top of the post, of, of the top of the point. We have taken some casualties, uh, most of them either from machine gun fire, which was off on the side, or from small arms fire coming down. And uh, Colonel Rudder established his command post just off the uh, top of the hill. The first thing that we do is we go up to the top and we find out we can't recognize anything because everything has been blown to hell. Any, any of the uh, landmarks that we're looking for are gone. We can locate the, uh, uh, the wow. gun positions. We can locate the uh, observation posts. We can locate some of the bunkers, but everything else is piles of dirt all over the place. <clears throat> we know that we have two gun positions we have to go find and disable. The first thing we find is there are no guns there. We never did find out whether the guns had been removed or whether they had ever been installed in the first place. Uh, my assumption is that, uh, I don't know, I really don't know. Anyhow, uh, now what we have to do, we have to eliminate uh, two machine gun nests and a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. Um, the assault on the machine gun nests by infantry is a pretty detailed operation. Uh, and <clears throat> we are being taken under fire by the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft battery, which is horrible. Uh, I would say that most of the casualties we took from the beginning of the after the the, the initial steps of the uh, of the assault were from that uh, anti-aircraft battery. We couldn't get anywhere near it, and uh, the the effect of an explosion of a 40 millimeter shell when it hits something is uh, not very pleasant. Uh, fortunately. The destroyer Satterley is roughly about 400 yards offshore, and they took that battery under fire and knocked it out. And in my opinion, the Satterley was probably instrumental in the success of the 2nd Ranger Battalion up at the top. And who was calling in the coordinates to the Satterley? They were seeing it from the, uh, from the sea. Uh, we had you have to understand we had zero communication, which resulted in a complete change of plan because the assumption was that the 2nd Ranger Battalion, the three companies of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, had been unsuccessful in their mission and had been destroyed at the top of Pont du Hoc because there was no, no communication. Colonel Rudder had fired a rocket but when you think that uh, there was so much going on, I mean, the sea is full of ships. Troops are landing at Omaha Beach. Troops are landing at Utah. And the term snafu originated during the uh, assault on Normandy. Absolutely, because the situation was normal. You should pardon me, all fucked up. Okay? Okay. Uh, The, uh, now we have mission number one is no longer there because there are no guns, okay? So what we now have to do is we have to go inland approximately, I'm going to guess, five to 800 yards to the road and establish a roadblock. Now you understand that this is not being done en masse. It's being done by groups of two, three, and four rangers going towards towards uh, the road. The, uh, the good thing was 
that every single ranger knew exactly what the missions were. And it doesn't matter whether there was a lieutenant in charge, whether there was a sergeant in charge, or corporal, or nobody. Everybody knew that we were supposed to get to the Grand Camp Road and establish a roadblock. Uh, it happened, of course, we established about six or seven different roadblocks, and that wasn't taken care of until close to the end of, of the day. Uh, two things happened uh, during the day of the 6th of June. Number one, uh, two of the sergeants from Dog Company, uh, and I'm sure that everybody knows their name, that was Sergeant Lamell and Sergeant Kuhn, went on a two-man patrol. They went past the Grand Camp Road and about four or five hundred yards down a country lane, what did they come across? Five of these large 150 millimeter guns in position, ready to fire. From their position, they would be able to fire not only at the ships on the sea, but they would have been able to fire at U Omaha and Utah Beach, both. For some unknown <coughs> and ungodly reason, the guns were not manned. Sergeant Lamell went over the hedgerow, went to the guns, went to four of the guns or five of the guns, I'm not sure how many, took thermite grenades, put them in the breach, closed the breach, and then they ran like hell. What they do, of course, when you put a thermite grenade in anything metal, it burns at something like 4,000 degrees and it absolutely fuses the metal so the guns are now useless. Uh, I never saw them after that because a couple of things happened. Uh, but I understand that the German gun crews were in the next field and they were either coming out of bunkers or they were in line for breakfast. They, had, they were far enough away so that they really didn't know what was going on out at the point. They didn't know that we had landed and we had actually taken position of the point itself. Well, what, what about all the cannon fire from the ships? Well, they didn't hear that? Oh, sure they did, but that's been going on for some time because as I have read about it, the, the theory was that we were not expected to land there. Everything was said that we would be landing at, uh, that the, 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 uh, the assault on... Uh, Cherbourg? No, not on Cherbourg, on Normandy would be at a place called Pas de Calais, which is the closest point from England to France, approximately 70 miles as I understand it. And that was where most of the German defenses were. Now, if we were 100 miles north of that. <coughs> and uh, anyhow, that's why, that's one of the main reasons why the German forces were not as strong where we landed as they would have been if we had landed at the Pas de Calais. Um, the defenses of the point, the German defenses, as I said, consisted of two things. They consisted of the, the machine gun nests all over the place, the anti-aircraft guns, uh, mines, and barbed wire. However, all of the mines and the barbed wire were on the other side of the gun positions because nobody was going to be able to climb that cliff. Any assault would have come from the land side. <clears throat> I would say that 90% of the mines were destroyed by complementary explosions from the gunfire uh, from, from, the, from the sea. Uh, the barbed wire was of no concern to us because we, hadn't, we didn't come across it. Uh, we didn't have to cross any barbed wire until we had to go beyond the position at the point, and then there were avenues to go through. Uh, I was in a, uh, I was with uh, my my platoon sergeant, who was Tom Ryan, and we stopped for a minute in one of the shell holes, either to catch our breath or do whatever we did, and Tom yelled at me to. Look out, I turned around and a German soldier is coming at me with a rifle and bayonet. Uh, I still had a 45. I shot him with the 45. 
the stopping power of a 45 is such that anybody who's going forward is going to turn around and go backwards from the force of the explosion. What happened, I'm sure he was dead before he hit the ground. However, his rifle and bayonet kept on coming. He hit the edge of the shell hole, bounced, and went into my leg. <clears throat> uh, I took my first aid packet, I bandaged it, I poured sulfa into it, uh, tied up the, uh, the bandage, pulled my pants back up, and off we went. Uh, we got to uh, the road, I would say, around noon, one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, time is of no essence. We have absolutely, you know, it's, I, I, I could have told you we have been there for 10 hours. It could have been 10 minutes, but time just went like that. Um, not only did we establish a roadblock, but I would say that five or six or seven roadblocks were established, all consisting of five or six rangers, uh, a BAR, uh, a light machine gun, and the riflemen who were, were there. Um, Bob Arman, who was one of the uh, senior lieutenants, uh, came up and he said, hey guys, this is no way to do it. We got to establish a real, a, a, a regular roadblock, which they did. It was in the shape of an L with the point pointing down towards where we thought the uh, uh, any reinforcements were becoming. They would be coming from Grand Camp on the way to Vereville. And uh, that's where we were. We, we, we took several, what I would call probing accounts um, during the night of the 6th of June, uh, more to find out, I think, how many of us were there, where we were located, and so forth, because there was no actual attempt to uh, come through us. During the day of the 7th of June, the same thing would happen. We sent out small patrols trying to find out where the Germans were. They were sending out small patrols to find out where we were. And the one thing that uh, we had to be on guard against is that on the point itself, from gun position to gun position to the observation post, there were both hidden, uh, not hidden, but covered tunnels and there were open, uh, open trenches. <clears throat> so as we're coming across the point towards the roadblock, German soldiers would be coming from the front of us, they'd be coming from behind us, they'd be coming from the right or the left, <clears throat> fortunately not in any uh, numbers, but individual individual attempts. They're trying to find out what the hell is going on in the first place, and uh, uh, we didn't. One of the unfortunate uh, happenings is that at one of the bunkers, there was a white flag flying, and two of the rangers in my group we're going towards this to find out what was going on to, or to accept the surrender of whoever was there. When they got within 10 feet of the opening, they were fired on by machine guns that were just waiting for them. Uh, from that point until I was relieved on the 8th of June, we took no prisoners. Um, what kind of soldier did you come across? Wehrmacht, SS? No, nah, there was no SS there. They were regular. They were regular, regular troops. Basically, they were probably artillery uh, to guard, to service the guns and so forth, and probably and probably a small contingent of uh, infantry uh, to protect protect the guns in the gun crews. Uh, I had no interest in who they were or where they came from. Uh, all we wanted to do was to complete our mission. Um, we're fighting now basically a defensive battle. Uh, we are half mile inshore, from the tip of the point I would say, uh, at the Grand Camp Road. Um, the uh, 
the night of the 7th, we began to get some uh, heavier concentration of troops. And now this is no longer patrol activity. It's uh, uh, offensive patrol, which means there are probably anywhere from a platoon to a company of Germans uh, coming. And they were coming from the, uh, from the uh, uh, Grand Camp area. Uh, the, the end result was that uh, they came in sufficient force to penetrate the, uh, um, the roadblock. Uh, a lot of the E Company uh, Rangers were overrun, a lot of them were taken prisoner, a lot of them were killed, and we all had to pull back. We now had to pull back far enough to establish a defensive perimeter uh, from one flank to the other of the point. That went on during the night of the 7th of June. Uh, on the 8th of June in the morning, um, we began to get some fire from the Omaha Beach, which is to the north, north end of the point, and it turns out that these are rangers from the 5th Ranger Battalion, and they are taking under fire whoever is firing a German machine gun, which is an MG42, happened to be some of our rangers, because we had run out of, most of us had run out of ammunition. We're now using whatever German supplies there were, and there was a lot of that stuff around. That went on for a very short period of time, about 30 minutes, until we both found out uh, that we were fighting ourselves. And uh, we did take some casualties from so-called friendly fire. Um, by this time, my leg has swollen up. It's blue, yellow, green, purple, and all different kinds of colors. I'm having, having trouble walking. So I go down to the, I'm taken to the aid station. Uh, I go down the cliff. I'm evacuated to the battleship uh, uh, Texas, taken back to uh, Weymouth Harbor, get off, I go to the field hospital, and that's the end of my ranger experience. I was in the hospital for approximately a week and a half, two weeks. <clears throat> uh, my leg has healed up, uh, and I am now reassigned back to the 5th Infantry Division, the 146th Field Artillery Battalion, which is getting ready to come over as the support troops now. And we landed again on the uh, 14th, of, uh, 14th of July of 1944. Uh, if you want me to go into the 5th Infantry uh, experience, that's going to take uh, another hour and so forth and so on, but I was with them. I was with them doing two things. I was a forward observer, which entails working with the assault platoon of the infantry uh, on uh, looking for targets of opportunity, or I am uh, a, uh, an air observer because I had been trained in air observing when we were back in, I in, in Ireland on training. Uh, so I uh, used to spend a week with the forward troops, a week uh, as an air observer, one, 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 going back and forth. That landed, that lasted, uh, well, we took part of the breakout, the St. Lowe break, breakout, and we're now part of the Third Army under General Patton. We went down to uh, Tours, went to Angers, went to Reims, went to Mont, uh, my, 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 <laughs> Mont, my, uh, my, Montero, uh, and we get to, uh, this is a period going from the middle of July until uh, early in September when the Third Army ran out of gas. We were at Metz uh, and we then stalled completely. Um, the uh, guns, the, the ammunition and supplies and so forth were sent up to Montgomery on the, in the First Army group uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, General Montgomery and General Patton had a uh, <laughs> violent test disposition towards each other. <laughs> I know that Patton had no use for uh, Montgomery. I'm sure the other, the other thing also applied. Anyhow, uh, to make a, a long story short, 
uh, General Patton decided that we were going to take Metz by, a, by assault. And Metz is surrounded by seven fortresses. The two biggest ones are Fort Driant and Fort uh, Jean d'Arc. Um, several attempts were made to assault the first thing that happened when we got there, uh, there were practically no German troops in Metz. But in the month, month and a half, two months that we were stalled there, something like 25,000 crack German troops moved back into Metz and its defenses, so now it's no longer a cakewalk. Um, we were successful. The 10th, the, the 140, the, the 46th Field Artillery Battalion was a direct support of the 10th Infantry <clears throat> of the 5th Division. The 11th Infantry had made a crossing of the Moselle River, had been forced out. And now in, uh, in October, uh, middle of October, the 10th Infantry uh, did make a crossing. Uh, and don't ask me where, because I don't remember the name of the town. Uh, but uh, it was up from Metz. Uh, we went across the river. We established a, a beachhead across the river. The entire division came through that beachhead, and now we assaulted Metz, and uh, somebody who was in command decided that it was going to cost too much and take too many, too many casualties to try and assault Metz completely by frontal assault. It couldn't be done, so what we did was we bypassed Metz. Uh, at a town near, it's called Creepy, Pardon me, I call it creepy. I don't think that was the name of the town. But we were on a night assault, and uh, my section and I were again in, in support of the infantry uh, assault platoon <coughs> coming down a uh, railroad embankment. And uh, as I wrote this up at one time, uh, I think I heard a loud boom. What happened was either we had been bracketed by two shells or there were two large mines on either side of this railroad embankment. To, to tell you what happened, I was blown up in the air. I came down across the, uh, the railroad track on my back. Uh, my section of six people, Sergeant... Uh, My, my, my section sergeant was untouched. The other four were killed. And I was, I woke up, I'm now unconscious. I wake, I wake up in a uh, first aid station. Uh, I'm sent from the first aid station back to a field hospital. I'm sent from the field hospital by plane uh, to a base hospital uh, in just outside of Oxford, England. The upshot of it was I had fractured a couple of vertebrae uh, I had shrapnel from here and here that went by the sides of me like somebody had taken fingernails and so forth. I had a fractured uh, shoulder blade. And basically that was the end of my war. I spent three months in the hospital. Uh, I got out of the hospital in January or February of 1945. I was on limited service. I was assigned to guard prisoners of war in an outfit called the 6951st Transit Prisoner of War Enclosure Unit, which we went to Re we went to Remagen, Germany, and in a field is something like 10 or 12,000 German prisoners being guarded by a whole bunch of guys with machine guns, and there were coils of barbed wire, and there were fence posts and we said to the Germans, go build your own, go build your own camp, which they did. And I was there until, uh, um, I forget when the war ended, the war ended in May as I recall, uh, at which point our job is to give discharges to the German soldiers and send them home. We discharged them from the German army and said go home. Uh, we also had troops from uh, American military government there who did all the interviewing to decide who was 
who was a good German or who was a bad German. And who was wanted. Huh? And who was wanted. Yeah. There were no good Germans as far as I was concerned at that per period of time. I had, I had an abiding hatred for uh, almost anything German. Fortunately, from my point of view, I was never experienced any of the uh, death camps, uh, for which I'm grateful to these days because, uh, well. When did you first start hearing stories that they were death camps? Well, we heard there were concentration camps. Probably, you kids were coming through. We're, we're, we don't get a lot of news, obviously. But where were you at that time? Where were you? Were you some place in, in France. Some place in France. Oh no, we were in France already. And, and these camps. What was the purpose of these camps? Did you have an idea of who was in the camps? Their purpose? I don't remember. I truly don't remember. Okay. Uh, we did not know what they were doing to the inmates of the camps. Had no idea. We thought we thought maybe they were all just kept there. Uh, of course, as we went around, and I don't remember the time frame when we find out they were being, the people were being annihilated. What about Malmendy? When did you first hear about Malmendy? Well, I was in the hospital at that time. In England? In England, right. And I think it was reported in Stars and Stripes, uh, probably in January of 1945. You mentioned the type of grenade yeah. these two sergeants had with them yeah. when they blew up these right. gun emplacements. Mm -hmm. What type of grenades were they? They're called used? thermite grenades. Now, was that something normal that well, they carried, were, or in this case, because they were they were climbing on that hill, they were they need, that was part of the equipment they needed. Well, we all we had uh, we had listen we had Bangalore torpedoes, uh, we had thermite grenades, and the thermite grenades were not carried by every soldier. They were just there, you know, and uh, uh, when they went on patrol, because what happened was after Lamel found these guns, he sent Kuhn back and picked up whatever grenades, probably about four or five more that were scattered around with the people on the uh, on the roadblock. And uh, uh, that's where it came from. What happened to those two men? I know you said you never saw them again. Well, after I left Lamel, Sergeant Lamel and Sergeant June both uh, survived the entire battle. They survived the Rangers in Germany, which was at Hill 400, a place called Hill 400. Don't ask me the name of the town because I don't know, but they took as many casualties there as they did, as we did on, uh, on D-Day. Prior to departing for Europe. Yeah. Uh, I've got two questions. One relating to Eisenhower. Right. Eisenhower went by, saw the uh, 101st Airborne. Did you or did anybody in your unit, were they greeted by Eisenhower before the no. actual? No. So nobody saw Eisenhower. No, we didn't. Right. I'm sure a lot of people saw Eisenhower. He met with the uh, people of the 101st Airborne, I know, because that's a famous photograph. He's saying goodbye to them. Today, what goes on in our education system, if you had something to say to the teenagers, the young adults, the parents who have young children, what kind of advice can you give them so they have a country that they can be proud of and make it a better country than what it may be today? The, uh, one of the comments that I hear from people who come up to me today and say, they say, uh, you know, they thank, thank you for your service. Uh, we don't have people like that today. That's not true because the situation uh, determines the people. I'm sure that given a so-called national emergency, that we have young people today who are perfectly capable of being the greatest generation of the next generation, if you follow what I'm saying. Uh, I think that it's important for the young people to know what has gone on before, whether it's contemporary history. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's a, uh, it's a mistake to glorify what, was gone, what went on in World War II. 
because it wasn't glory. It was a sense of mission, if you will. And that sense of mission started at the top and worked its way down. So we had a mission when we landed on Pont du Hoc. At the top, they had a mission also, which was to destroy the, the ability of the enemy and to take the ground and occupy the ground until it was not necessary any longer. Um, I was coming back uh, in August of 1945. I was on a ship coming back to the United States for what they called rest, rehabilitation, and reassignment. Uh, I was coming back as a casual officer. And you know what reassignment meant at that time. After you are rested and rehabilitation, you're going to Japan. Well, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, they dropped the bombs on in Japan. And uh, I knew then that, uh, you know, the war is gonna be over and uh, that was gonna be the end of it. Do you think our government at that time, Harry Truman, made the right decision? Yeah, absolutely, government? absolutely. Not a bit of a question in my mind. I think to, to take the Japanese homeland by assault would have cost millions of casualties. And uh, uh, war is uh, not very nice. I understand there were civilian casualties. Uh, so be it. Captain Klein. I want to thank you on behalf of the uh, Jewish war veterans and the next greatest generation. Thank, thank you. you so much for your time and uh, I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I'd like to ask you, for the record, please state your first, last name, your serial number, and your rank. Okay, uh, George Goldstone Klein. My first serial number was 20613287. That's my enlisted number. My officer number is zero for officer, 116-79038. And I got out of the service as a uh, second lieutenant. I was probably the ranking second lieutenant in the United States Army. Stayed in the reserves, I retired as a captain. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome.